publishing applications and content. In the last section, we installed some applications onto our Citrix server. So far, we've got that, that Citrix server configured. We've, uh, we've got our clients configured. We've, uh, we've, we've finished the installation of some applications, and we, uh, we're ready to actually make those applications available to our users. And, and then that's what we're going to talk about in this nugget. We're going to talk about how we publish applications and desktops. There's the concept in Citrix that you can uh, make available a full desktop to a user, or you can make available an application. We're going to talk about why we would want to do that, why, would we, would be, why we would want to do desktop, uh, publi uh, publishing desktops to our users as opposed to publishing applications. We're also going to show you specific how each one of these is done. And, and we're also going to talk about some best practices, why you would do uh, publishing applications in a certain way and in some, some situations why you would want to publish a desktop to users and, and what the established best practices are for doing that. In addition to applications and desktops, we're going to talk about publishing content, which is the, the idea of publishing not really an application, but publishing a link to some data, whether that's a, a, an Office document or an, a, 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 an Internet Explorer website, making that available to someone and why we'd want to do that as well. And, and as part of that, we're going to talk about client-to-server redirection. If I, if I have something that, uh, that wants to initiate on a client, how I can redirect that to my Citrix server to do the processing on my Citrix server. And then the reverse of that, which is server-to-client redirection, which is if I'm, if I'm trying to access a resource on my Citrix server and I want to actually run that resource on my Citrix client. But first, let's talk about why we would want to publish applications. Now, let's think back to the reason why you're listening to this, this nugget in the first place. You're probably listening to this nugget because you've already made a decision to deploy some applications to your users using Citrix. And, and you want to learn why you would want to do that. Now, Citrix has some feature sets that are not available inside of terminal services for, uh, for Windows 2003. Namely, publishing applications is a big one. And, and, and you want to be able to provide that, that sense of seamless applications to your users. Now, you remember uh, when we talked in a previous nugget about uh, the Citrix connection configuration? And if I go to the RDP connection name, this is uh, when my users attempt to connect via terminal services, I have the ability of creating an initial program here. And what this says is that if my users attempt to connect via terminal services to my, to my server, then it's going to allow them this initial, um, this, this, this initial program, but no access to no other programs. Now, you know, this is great because this limits the, uh, the access that my users have when they use terminal services, but this is not published applications. I can only do one program. I can't do multiple programs or, or rich access based on roles. And this is what Citrix provides to me. Citrix provides the capability of deploying applications to users based on who they are, based on their membership in groups, I can give them desktops if, they're, if they, they need a desktop. I can give them access just to certain applications. And, and that's the, one of the main feature sets of why people purchase Citrix. As you'll see here, I've gone back to my management console for presentation server, and I have two applications. One that we've talked about before, this is the Nugget Notepad. This is the, the seamless connection to um, Notepad that we created in a previous Nugget. And now I have this new one here called CTX Nugget 1 Desktop. Let me move over to my uh, workstation here, and you'll see on this workstation, I've brought up Citrix Program Neighborhood, I've connected into my Nugget Farm, and I now have both of these uh, applications available to my user here. This is, this is my user's desktop. I've also made a connection to both of these applications. You see here that I've got the, the Notepad connection, and I've also got the CTX Nugget 1 desktop application here. This is a published desktop. And what I mean by saying that is, it's exactly that. It's a, it is the full desktop. I've got my start menu here. I've got access to all of my applications. I've got my all programs in here. This is essentially like remote desktop or term, you know, using terminal services to connect into my server. On the other hand, I have the, the Notepad application here, which, as you can see, it's, it's only this Notepad application, and there's nothing more to it. Now, that gets back to another question, and that is why we would want to de deploy one versus the other. Now, if I have users that I, I want them to be able to see an application, but I may not, 
they they may not be at a at a at a technical level to really understand the app the access to that application or maybe I don't trust them I'm, I I don't have a lot of trust that they won't try to to get in and then try to dig around and see what they can mess up then I probably want to give them access to an application so that they have the, the the ability to access those applications but they really don't have anything beyond that. This is, a, this is a good example if I have a task worker, for example, that, that needs access to a particular application. Maybe it's a call center application, or maybe it's, a, a, it's, a, it's an application that's required to do their job, a database application. And then maybe I have some knowledge workers that need a desktop. Maybe these are users in a, in a remote location, for example, that are doing software development and they need access to a full desktop to, to do this. Or maybe I, I have more trust for these users that they're not going to try to dig around and see what they can get, uh, get access to inside of my server, so I want to give them full access to the, a typical desktop. In those situations, I'd probably want to give them that full access. Now, it's worth stating here that if I provide a full desktop to my users, it's actually going to consume more resources on my system because there are, if I look here at uh, the, uh, the task manager, in order to provide that full desktop, I actually have to put a lot more resource use in place in order to make it available. I have to do a full explorer.exe shell. I have to do a winlogon.exe process. All of these processes have to be in place to have this full rich desktop. Now, in the case of this notepad application, I really only have to have the notepad because that's the only application that I'm providing to the user. And so my resource use is lower. So back to my original question of why do I want to use published applications versus published desktops? That's going to be an architectural decision based upon your environment. Um, if your environment leans towards the desktop paradigm for deploying applications to users, well, you're going to want to deploy those desktops, but also to make sure they're very secure. If, you're, if your environment uh, leans towards the applications paradigm, well, you have the, the convenience of just deploying the applications, but your users may not have the rich experience that they're used to seeing. So that being said, let's talk about how we actually deploy applications and desktops to users. Let's actually create another published application and, uh, and, and step through that process we would do to create that published application. I'm going to right click here on the applications node and I'm going to choose publish application. The very first thing I'm required to do from the wizard is obviously give it a display name. In this case, let's publish Microsoft Word for our users. So I'm going to type in Microsoft Word here and if I want, I can uh, paste it down here in the application description or I can, I can provide a more detailed application description here. I click the next key and then I get to specify what I want to publish. Now, here's where I get the option to deploy either an application or a desktop and, and we'll talk about content a little bit later in this nugget. But this is a location where I'm going to put in the command line for Microsoft Word. So I click the Browse button, I go to CTX Nugget 1, which is where I'm going to deploy this application from, and in the C drive and program files, I'm going to go to Microsoft Office and Office 11, and I'm going to look for the winword.exe application. This is the exe that you would use to launch Microsoft Word. You'll see it puts the command line here and also a working directory. We talked before about uh, isolation environments. I can choose to isolate that application here. But for, for the purposes of this demonstration, I just want to show you that this is how you act, would actually deploy that application. I click Next, and I go to the next screen. And this is where I get the, the, the option to choose a program neighborhood folder where this application would get deployed to. Now, switching back to my Windows XP box and looking at program neighborhood here, you'll see I don't have any folders that I've created yet. It would look like a little folder icon if it was here. I could potentially, when I deploy the application, put it in a folder so that I could aggregate my applications by folder. It's worth mentioning also that anytime I include a program neighborhood folder for an application, that's also going to adjust how it appears inside of web interface. So, if it appears inside a program neighborhood folder, it's also going to appear inside of a web interface folder. Now a little bit below here, if I'm using the program neighborhood agent, I could potentially add this to the client's start menu if I wanted. You see I did that before with the, uh, uh, the Nugget Notepad application. I could put it under programs if I wanted to, the programs uh, folder, or I could put it inside its own individual start menu folder.
if I wanted to, I could uh, I could add a shortcut to the client's desktop so that when the client logs in and logs into Program Neighborhood Agent, they would be able to they would see it right on their desktop. I have an, app, uh, an option for the application icon. I can choose the default icon that's associated with that, that exe file that I created a few screens back, or I can change the icon to uh, any number of ones that are available here. I could, uh, I could switch to a different file name and, and look at the icons that are associated with that file name, or I could even use the Citrix default icons, which are available to me. If you, you, know, if you have your own icons, you can connect them to your own icons if you want. I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose the default here. If you're an icon developer and you like to you know, pencil in your own icons, well, be merry. If I click the next uh, button again, I get the option of checking my session window size. Uh, here I have it to 640 by 480. I could potentially set it to you know, any, any number of resolutions, or I could set it to a custom resolution if I wanted some kind of wacky resolution, or I could set it to a percent of client desktop. If I set it to 100%, that fills the client desktop. If I set it to less than that, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, obviously less than that. Or I could do full screen if I wanted to. This would mean if I, as soon as my user launched the application, it would appear full screen and they wouldn't be able to access anything else while it's full screen. I'm just gonna choose 640 by 480 and, and 256 colors. I could do more colors if I wanted to, and you and you can do colors if you want. If you if you have a need for more colors, let's say you're doing a, a, a graphics program or a, or a GIS application that requires really really high color, you could potentially put more color here. But it's worth saying that the more color bits there, the 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 the, the bit resolution for uh, colors, the more that you put in there the more requirements for uh, bandwidth. It's gonna take more bandwidth to, uh, to get from server to client to send all those colors down. So, so if you can do six, 256 colors or even 16 colors, you're gonna reduce that, uh, that, that signature for amount of bandwidth per user that's required. In this next section, it talks about application startup settings. I can, I can change the way that my application looks when it gets deployed to the users. I can choose to just maximize the application inside of this session window, or I could choose to hide the application title bar, so all you would see would be the, the Citrix title bar instead of the application title bar. And it's, it says here that startup settings are ignored in seamless mode ICA settings. This is to say that if my client attempts to connect in seamless mode, which if I shift back here to my, my, uh, my XP box, you'll see this notepad is in seamless mode. Those settings are actually ignored because it just, it shows up as the application itself because it's seamless. So be aware of these whenever you're deploying the application. If you're gonna deploy that application in seamless mode, you probably won't need to check any of these. I click next and I have specifying client requirements. I can choose uh, to enable audio for the client. I can make a minimum requirement for that audio. So if you don't have a need for audio, for example, Microsoft Word doesn't have a need for audio, I, you should disable this because that will disable that ICA channel, further reducing the amount of bandwidth that you're going to need to, do, to, to send this application to your clients. You can enable the encryption protocols here for, uh, for the client. And it, it's, it's like it says here, there is no minimum requirement for this option and the client devices can override this. Encryption levels are set as it was on the client as well to 128-bit logon only or 40-bit or 56 or 128-bit. In practice, the level of encryption doesn't tend to reduce the performance of uh, the, uh, the, the, the user's experience on the client. So if you can have a very high level of encryption, then it, it, it's probably going to be to your benefit because then that, that protocol or that, that traffic as it moves from client to server is going to be secured. Lastly, we have the option of, of waiting for printers to be created or not waiting for printers to be created as the application starts. If your client has a lot of printers that it needs to create, as part of the logon process, if I check this box, it'll start that application and then finish up with installing those printers later on. That can actually significantly decrease the amount of time it takes for that client to get uh, to, to, to launch the application. So I click next. Here I get the option of choosing specif or specifying application limits. I can actually limit the number of times that this particular application can run in a server farm. This would prevent my clients from trying to open multiple copies of uh, Microsoft Word, for example. Or I could say, okay, you're, no, you're not allowed to have more than two or three or four or, or, or whatever I'm interested in. Or I can say, I only allow one instance of the application for each user. 
down under CPU priority level, this gives me the option of saying for some applications, as I publish them, do they get more priority on the processor? Let's say uh, I have two versions of Microsoft Word, one for the executives and one for the, for the low level, the, 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 the mensch that are sitting out in the, in the, in the cube farms. In this case, I'd make perhaps one at high priority. I want my executives to have as much processor as possible, and then one at normal priority for my, my people out in the cube farm. For the most part, it's usually a good idea to leave the CPU priority at normal for all of these. I'm going to click next, and we're going to talk about access control. When we, when we talked about the farm settings, we had the option of connections to the farm to be limited to through, the, uh, the, through MSAM version 4. I can create MSAM filters here. To, for how I want my users to connect via various uh, MSAM farms. For the purposes of the CCA, you just need to know that this is something you can do. Um, for the purposes of deploying this application, I don't care. I just am going to allow any other connection to come into this application. Now, this is important. When I create Citrix servers, it's very important that I deploy applications to the same location. Now, you remember when we went back on the very first screen we talked about where we're going to get the, micro, or the winword.exe process. You'll see here it says C, Program Files, Microsoft Office, Office 11, winword.exe. And it's important that in all of my Citrix servers that would be load balancing this application that this exe is always in the same spot on all the servers. And the reason for this is, as I go back to, the, uh, to this setting again, I have the option of choosing which servers I could potentially use to host this application. Because of this, if I try to put both of these servers in here and say, OK, I want this application to be available on both servers, well, it, it better as well be available on both of those servers, uh, or I'm going to have problems. Now, if you did, for some reason, happen to deploy the application to a different location, you can click the server and choose this Edit Configuration button. And this will actually allow you to change the location where it is. So, so if for some reason and on CTX Nugget 2, I said, well, I didn't put it in the Office 11 folder. I put it in the Office 11B folder. I could create the, a configuration specific to this server for connecting to the application. So all is not for naught. But it's a good idea. It's a best practice to always deploy applications exactly the same, the same configuration, the same location, everything to the same to each Citrix server. Now for this demo, I'm just going to deploy this to CTX Nugget 1. I just want to do it off of this one server. And in the later Nugget, we're actually going to show you how you can load balance this application across multiple servers and why you would want to do that. So let me click Next. The next screen uh, says, which users do I want to enable access for this application? Now this is the really cool part, is if I want to say, OK, well, more often than not, I, any user here can get access to uh, WinWord, so I'll just give the domain users rights to the application. I can do that. Or if I wanted, I could click this button here and say, well, you know, I'm more interested in actually really locking down who gets access to this. Instead of domain users, for example, well, I'm, I actually like Jane Nugget, and I think Bob Nugget was the, uh, the two guys that needed the access to Microsoft Word. I could get down to that granular level if I wanted to. Or if I wanted to, if I really didn't care for monitoring who was coming into the application, I could click this box here that says, Allow Anonymous Connections. You notice how everything grays out when I do that? If I click this Allow Anonymous Connections, this will actually leverage some anonymous users, some anonymous local users on my system, to allow people to connect into the application without entering in any credentials whatsoever. Now, there are some hazards associated with this. If, if I allow anonymous connections into my, into my environment, then I have no way of locking down an application to particular users. I have no way of auditing which users are coming in. Because each user comes in with an anonymous account, that I'm not going to know where those users are coming from or really who they are. So if you're going to allow anonymous connections into any particular applications, be aware of this and, and only provide access to to or, or, or connection ability to the people that you know. Now, I do want to also say that you know, you're, you're asking probably the question, well, who are these anonymous connections? How am I actually making use of these anonymous connections? Anytime you install Citrix onto a server, I'm going to go to Manage here. 
it's going to create 15 anonymous connections. You'll see here, this is the local users on this server. You see a non-000 through a non-014. These are built-in accounts for anonymous access to Citrix applications. This is, these are used by Citrix to, to connect those users into the server whenever I'm using this anonymous connections here. For our first demo here, though, I'm, I'm not really interested in locking it down to Bob and Jane. They, they always think that they need access to everything, but really I'm more interested in getting everybody access to Microsoft Word. So I'm going to put domain users down here. Let me click Next. If there were some file type associations with this application, I could choose those file type associations here and connect those to this published application. This is, this is used anytime I'm trying to use client to server content redirection or program neighborhood agent. Um, it, for example, XLS for Microsoft Excel. Um, there's a whole slew of them for Microsoft Access. But this is where that, those file type associations would be selected and enabled. I have the option of choosing finish here and now the published application is complete. You'll see under my Applications node, I have this new Microsoft Word application. Notice before that uh, I had my Windows XP box connected to the Nugget Notepad and the CTX Nugget 1 desktop. You'll see here that when I click on those applications under the Users tab in the right pane, I get the option of seeing which users are currently using that application. Now, this says that for this desktop, the user administrator is connected into CTX Nugget 1 using the client name Nugget 1 and the session name ICA TCP2. If I right click on this, I could disconnect that user from the application. I can send them a message. I could potentially shadow the application and, and look over their shoulder and maybe help them with a problem with their, uh, with, with their uh, uh, application. I could reset the entire uh, ICA channel, which would drop the application immediately. I could choose status and see how much, uh, how much bytes and frames and what the, the data is coming in and out of that uh, connection. This is really handy if I'm having problems. Let's, let's say I've got an application that's particularly troublesome. Uh, Internet Explorer sometimes has this problem where you'll look and Internet Explorer is using more resources than it really should on, on that server. And so if I, if I know that I've got a user that's got a, maybe a hung instance of Internet Explorer or one that's spiking a processor, I can go in here and I can reset that user's connection and bam, they lose access immediately to Internet Explorer, but at least the other users on my server aren't getting a loss of their user experience because they're spiking the traffic. Or if I'm getting ready to maybe bring the server down, I can click send message and say, okay, well, I'm about to bring down the server. Please get off, or something perhaps a little nicer. But, but this allows me to communicate with my users very easily. If I click OK here and then I go back to Nugget 1, you'll see that this, my users now have, oh no, I've got a message from the administrator. I'm about to bring down the server. Please get off the server. So this gives me the ability to communicate, at least unidirectionally, with my users when I have problems or when I need to notify them of things. The last thing we wanted to talk about with published applications are really some best practices for creating good published applications that are easy for your users. Um, we, we created this Microsoft Word application, and if I switch back to my Windows XP box and I go to my program neighborhood, you'll see that Microsoft Word is now available inside of their program neighborhood. The same is true if I go to my program neighborhood applications. This is the program neighborhood agent. You'll see that these applications are available inside of program neighborhood agent. The same is true for web interface as well. But the best practice here is you want to make these icons very um, easy for your users to figure out what they are. If you can create folders for these applications, put all of the Microsoft applications into a Microsoft folder and, and, and put the desktops into a desktop folder, but make it easy for your users to, to know what they're trying to connect to, do that. I can also create folders in here under, under applications. I can create folders and call it Microsoft Applications and deploy my Microsoft applications inside a folder here. This allows me to, inside of my program, or my presentation server, my, my uh, um, CMC, to align my applications in the same way that I'm aligning them on the client side. So, so make it easy for your, your users to connect to these applications. Also, if you have multiple applications that need to connect to each other, for example, Word and Excel may need to, uh, need to write data back and forth, or maybe I'm publishing Microsoft uh, Outlook, and Outlook needs to be able to spawn Microsoft Word when I get an attachment. I want my users to be able to have those applications available. 
So if I am publishing Microsoft Outlook on a server, I probably want to have Word installed on that server. It may not need to be published, but it can still be available on that server so that Outlook can spawn the Word application when it needs to to, to handle those attachments. Whenever you're sitting down and architecting your, your, your Citrix environment, you're going to want to look very closely at the application sets you have available and make sure that all of the connections between those application sets and the data that they need to connect to and any, connect, any other applications that that application may connect to, all of those are available on individual Citrix servers. Another best practice that's worth discussing is availability to data. If your users need to connect to a certain file share or a certain location elsewhere on the network, or perhaps even to their own desktops to access their data, if you're going to publish a Microsoft Word application, for example, on this server, then you should probably make a connection to that data as part of a logon script or maybe a, 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 a startup script, some sort of configuration so that the users are able to connect to those applications. If I go back here to Nugget 1, and I see here that my notepad is enabled, if I go to File and open on Notepad, you'll see that I have access to the, C, the Windows drive on the Citrix server. This is the C drive on the Citrix server itself. Now this can be kind of confusing to users if they're used to being able to go to the C drive and they think it's their local C drive, that can actually cause some confusion for them. Their client drives are actually here down, down under U and V. You'll see this is C dollar on client and D dollar on client. If you have for perhaps a, a G drive for your shared or, your, or an S drive or some other drive letter that you have configured for shared documentation and maybe an, maybe an H drive for your home drives, you'll want to, as part of a logon script, you'll want to configure those so that they're available so the users will know that they can connect to those or will, will see inside of this drop-down list that they have that connection available. It's worth mentioning, too, as some sort of education to your users that you want to let them know that the C drive on Citrix-enabled applications is not their local C drive. We, we didn't talk about this during the, the installation, the Citrix install uh, nugget, but there is the ability to create a drive remapping on your Citrix server so that you can remap your Citrix server drives to a different drive letter. For example, you can make the, uh, the Citrix drive the, the Citrix system drive and the M drive, for example. And then that would mean that the C drive would be the C drive of your local system. I'll show you how that's done. I've, I've flipped back to my Citrix server and I want to double click on this folder that contains the install files for Citrix. We, we were in this folder before. And you see this, this drive remap.exe file? We didn't talk about this before, but this, this uh, exe file will actually remap those server drives to a different drive. This used to be part of the Citrix install in previous versions, but they've actually made it a separate, uh, separate executable now. Now, it's worth noting, you need to do this remapping before you ever do any Citrix installation or any application installation whatsoever to the server. So if you're already at this point, it's too late. You'll need to start all over again to, to do this drive remapping. But if you do want to make those that C drive local to your users, you could potentially do that by remapping the system drive to another drive. So let's, let's go ahead and close this and let's move on to the next section, and that is publishing content. We've talked about apps and desktops, but in this case, we don't want to publish access to an application or, or a full desktop for someone. We want to publish access to a, a piece of content, for example, a, an Excel file or, or maybe a web page. Now, now, why would I want to do that? Let's say I'm a big company, right, and, and I've got lots and lots of data out there. Well, well it's, it's, it's been studied that more people, as the amount of data gets bigger and bigger inside of an organization, people spend more and more of their time looking for the data. There's a lot of wasted productivity hours while people are trying to locate the necessary data they need to do their job. Well, what Citrix does is it provides us a very easy mechanism for us to, to add to our, our published applications menu here, our, our, our program neighborhood list, specific data that we want our users to have access to. So this makes it very, very easy for our users to, to find data. Let me give you an example. Let me, let me click on my computer and on the C drive, and I've, I've created a reports folder here, and you'll notice that I've actually shared this reports folder out. If I click on properties here, I'm going to click on the sharing tab and permissions, and you'll see that the everyone group has read access to this folder. Maybe I just want people to, to be able to see this report, these reports, but not actually edit them. 
And you'll see I've got this status.xls file. And for, for our demo, let's, let's, let's just call this our sales status report for the month. And you go, whoa, Greg's, uh, Greg's had a pretty good report, uh, March, uh, the good report this month. And, and Dan's not doing so well. And Eloise was doing well, but, but she's down. Well, I want my users to be able to have easy access to this sales status report because you know, they want to see how they're doing from month to month. So I can actually publish this as content inside of the CMC. Let's do that now. So we go back to the CMC, and just like I would publish an application, I'm going to publish a piece of content. Let's call it uh, sales status report, and I'll give that also the, uh, the application description as well. Now, before I would choose application or full desktop if I wanted a desktop, but in this case, I want to publish this as content. I would first click down here and choose whether or not this is an HTTP site or a file site. If this is a website, I would publish the, the web URL here. Since this is a file, I'm going to publish the file URL. I need to have the folder shared so I can use this addressing location to find it. It's on CTX Nugget 1 in the, in the uh, uh, reports folder. And then sub to that reports folder, it's called status.xls. And just to double check, see reports and status.xls. I can give it a program neighborhood folder that I want to. I could put this, for example, in the reports folder. Let's do that. Same options as before with application shortcuts or the icon itself. I can do the same thing as before with MSAM. Uh, I've got to get, give its access to some people. In this case, I don't really care who sees it because I want everyone to know how people are doing with sales. And bam, I've got a new published application called the Sales Status Report. If I go back to my Nugget 1 and allow this to, to uh, 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 refresh, you'll see I've got a new folder here called Reports. Inside that is my Sales Status Report. Now, I'm going to double-click this, but I want you to notice what happens when I double-click it. Uh-oh, Windows cannot open this file. Well, wait a minute. I, I thought I was using Citrix to publish the application. Now, well, wait a minute. This version of, of Windows uh, XP doesn't even have Microsoft Office installed to it. So I'm trying to deploy this piece of content to this, lo to this, this, uh, this Windows XP box, but that Windows XP box doesn't have the necessary applications to run this content. If I, if I click select the program from a list, you're going to see that there's no Windows uh, Excel there anywhere. Well, well, what do I do in this situation? Let me go back to uh, my uh, Citrix box. And this is the concept of client to server redirection. So, I may want to be able to publish this content, but maybe my users don't. Uh, maybe my users can't access. It. Maybe they don't have the right applications, and so they can't access the data. Well, I can put Excel on my Citrix server and on your Citrix server, and 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 then they would be able to run that content from the Citrix server. The first thing I've got to do, obviously, is I've got to make available Microsoft Excel. Let's do that now. Let's 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 create an application for Microsoft Excel, just like we did for Word. We'll go Microsoft Excel. And it's an application, so we'll browse to it just like we did for the last one. Program files, Microsoft Office, Office 11, and in this case it will be Excel.exe instead of WinWord.exe. All the same things like we did before. I've got the Excel icon here, or same window size. Uh, I'm not interested in audio. I want high encryption. I uh, don't care about limiting the instances. I don't care about MSAM. It's on CTX Nugget 1. All this stuff like I did the last time, except this time I'm publishing Microsoft Excel. Now, what I'm going to do differently this time is you'll see that I have these file type associations that the server has pulled from the registry. And in this case, all of the XLS type file type associations are available in here that it's pulled by, by going to uh, a, a location on the server and choosing folder options and file types. And you've seen this screen before. This is where Windows knows how to associate, for example, an HTM with an HTML document or, uh, or the ICA, a dot .ICA with the Citrix ICA client. Well, that's where Citrix has pulled this information. In this case, I want to make sure all of those Excel file type associations are available for this client to server content redirection. So let me click finish here. And now we've created an application. You'll see here now I've got Microsoft Excel sitting right above Microsoft Word. So the next thing I'm going to do is go back to my Windows XP box. I see my sales status report here, and I, I double-click again. And lo and behold, now I can connect 
to that published content by using the Excel on the server. This is the client to server redirection. In the same vein, if I'm using um, published or program neighborhood here, program neighborhood agent, if I have an XLS file on my local system, then I could potentially use the server to connect to this local XLS file. Let's do this now. So let me click on my computer and in the C drive, I've got this folder called sales files. And this is local to my, uh, my XP box. I've got this sales by weekday folder. Now before I didn't have Excel installed on this machine, but uh, if I double click it, you'll see that it connects back to the server. It's going to launch Excel on the server and then come back to my machine using the mapped client drives and allow me to view this file on my machine. So I can make available um, a, a, a more seamless connection to applications. My users can double click on files and they may get an application that's served off the server. They may get an application that's local to their workstation. They don't care. All they know is if they need Excel, it's available to them. So the last thing I'm going to show you is the, is the reverse of what we talked about, and that's server to client redirection. Now, server to client redirection is, is slightly different. It's not the exact reverse of what client to server is, but let's say I have a particular web page, for example, or a particular media file that uh, I don't want to run on the server because running that web page could, could consume a lot of server resources. You know, if, I'm, if I've got a really complex web page with a lot of stuff on it, or if I'm streaming media of some form, perhaps I don't want to make available that on the server because I don't want to tax that server's resources. Well, in that case, I can use server to client redirection, which will say if a client attempts to connect to any form of, of uh, or particular forms of, of media like HTTP and HTTPS or, or real audio, in those cases it will actually redirect that connection back to the client so that the client's browser will actually parse those connections. You'll see here that it supports HTTP, it supports HTTPS for web and secure web, uh, RTSP and RTSPU for real player and QuickTime connections, and also PNM for legacy real player, and MMS, which is the Microsoft Media Format. Now I can, enable, I can enable these from one of three locations. If I go back to my management console and I go to the Nugget Farm and, and go to the Farm settings, and then I go to MetaFrame settings here, I can enable content redirection from server to client if I check here. I can also do it on a uh, per server basis if I go to each individual server and choose the properties there. In the same MetaFrame settings location, I can, I can do content redirection from server to client. I can either use the farm settings or, or enable it here. Lastly, I can create a policy if I wanted inside of MetaFrame policies. And uh, I'm going to let me create, or let me just go to an existing policy and we'll, we'll show you where that's located at. Under user workspace, um, content redirection and then content redirection from server to client. This, is, this does the same thing as everything else, but it's done in a policy format. By doing that, if I have, for example, a published desktop or a, or, or a published application that attempts to connect to one of these types of resources, then instead of running that on the server, it's going to go ahead and run it on the client. It's going to send down that, that uh, URL to the client and launch it on a client resource. Now, obviously, the client's going to have to be able to access that resource like the server would be able to for this to function. So if you enable this, make sure you test it for the applications of which you're interested in, in pushing down from the server to the client. So let's review what we talked about. In this nugget, we talked about publishing applications and desktops, and we, we gave some good examples of why you would want to do it in the first place. We, we also talked about how you would do each, each one, how you would deploy applications, how you would deploy desktops. We gave some best practices for how to do it, some, some things that are maybe, maybe a little outside the CCA, but are good ideas whenever you deploy your Citrix server for what you would want to, how you would want to deploy those applications in the best way possible. We talked about content, and in the situations when you don't don't have applications on those on your clients, how you can say, okay, client, I want to give you access to that application on the server. That's client to server redirection. And lastly, how to do server to client redirection. So I can offload some of that uh, that Internet Explorer or or that uh, real audio type processing onto the client. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.